anybody could be a DJ. There's celebrity DJs, there's DJs that don't even know anything about mixing, don't even know anything about scratching, don't even know anything about DJing at all. And some of them don't even have turntables. They just have a laptop and know how to boop, press a button. You can hire another DJ that can push a button and yeah, we can play the same songs, but it's how you play that music. When I walk in, nine times out of 10, the party's packed already. So now it's my job to take that good time to another level. So now I'm gonna get on the mic and I'm gonna tell them I'm in the building. And then from there, I'm gonna play the biggest record in the world and try to elevate that party. That feeling when you go to a club and you go to a party and you see people rocking, it's kind of like a satisfaction, like I did that. That's like my job being complete. There's nothing better for me than going to a club and somebody can have a fucked up day or a bad day and you can change their mindset. You can change the way that they think. You can change everything about them to make them have a great day. So that makes me enjoy it even more. Respect the DJ. The DJ is the one that breaks the record. The DJ is the one that takes that chance. I'm the kind of person I don't ask for respect. I'm gonna demand it. And if you don't give it to me, I'm gonna take it. DJ, DJ. Oh, one. It starts at 4 o'clock in the morning when I get up and I start working out. I wear my pajamas because I ain't got the time to do all that. Alright, so we gotta get this workout in. So Robert. <laughs> now the first thing we do is decide what call we're gonna drop. I started DJing as a kid. I used to take the bus to school with my high school at the time was Andrew Jackson. And Andrew Jackson was the first high school in the country for metal detectors. That's how bad the school was. One day I was waiting for the bus. It was cold outside. And Clue, who I didn't know was DJ Clue at the time. I knew him as Ernesto. You know, he, used to, he lived on my block. He pulled up in a brand new car. So I, you know, I ran him down, I flagged him down. Yo, Ernesto, yo, what are you, what are you doing? He was like, I'm a DJ. And I was like, yeah, all right, buddy, all right, you must be selling drugs. Let like, put me on. I need to know what you're doing because I need to get bread. And he was like, I'm a DJ. I was like, yeah, all right. I went to his mom's house after school. And when his mom, you know, I rang the doorbell, his mom walked me downstairs. And when I got there, it was just tons of records. I was like, what the hell? He was like, yeah, I'm a DJ. So he showed me him being a DJ and told me he was DJ Clue. And I remember listening to him and listening, and listening to his tapes. I remember even bootlegging his stuff in my high school selling stuff because I needed to make money. And I was bootlegging clothes, this was my neighbor. So I was like, bet I'm a DJ. It started from there, you know, I, I saved money, bought my first turntables, and I came up with a name, which was DJ Shrimp at the time, because I was so short at the time that I was in high school, I was like 5'4", so I was a little kid, I was the smallest kid in school. So I was DJ Shrimp, and I had a partner, his name was DJ Mono, and together we were NV Productions. And uh, we started doing mixtapes. We started selling them all over Jamaica Avenue. We started selling them all over the hood. We'd go to the hood trying to sell the mixtapes. And um, we weren't selling them. Nobody wanted to buy them. Just, we were doing bad. And my partner at the time, Mona, was like, you know what? We're not making no money. I don't want to do it. So I'm, uh, I'm done. But what happened when we used to give the tapes to the bootleggers and all the, the people that were selling tapes, I was DJ Shrimp, he was DJ Mona, but the stamp would say Envy. Productions. So when I used to go to sell a tape, everybody would be like, I envy, I envy. And they started staying calling me envy. And that's how the, the name DJ Envy stuck. Like if you look at this booth, this is this booth right here with so many rappers used to rap. Joe Button used to rap in there. Fabulous used to rap in there. I think Fat Joe might have even rapped in there one time, man. This is all from my mom's house. Even all that equipment over there was all from my mom's house where, where, where my start happened, you know? and it's still janky and I still use it. Like the mic is still hung up on a wire over there. It's for the DJs. You know, when you used to rock a club and you couldn't put the records back into the case, so you just left them like that. I mean, look at this, you got Jay-Z. This is uh, my scratch record. Look how old this is, man. This is when I used to, to cut and scratch and do, to do tricks. So I used to, used to put the little tape so you know exactly what a record is. Shout out to Boogie Black. I actually stole this from Boogie Black. But... 
first pair of turntables that I earned was a Gemini. I believe they were the XDD 10s belt drive. Belt drive meaning there was no slide. You couldn't spin it back. You couldn't really cut. You really had to practice and find crazy ways to learn how to scratch on those turntables. Then I saved up money and I bought one turntable. I bought one Technique 1200. So I had one 1200 on the right side and I had a Gemini on the left. Then I, you know, saved some more money. And I used to save my money. My parents used to give me lunch money every day. And I would take the lunch money, me and my friend, the kid that, that actually taught me how to DJ, that was DJ with me, his name is Mona. We would go to lunch and we would buy a coffee cake. We would split it in half, split that coffee cake in half, and we share it. And we would take the money that his mom gave and the money that my mom gave me, and we would buy a record, you know, save towards a turntable. And we did that till we were able to get two turntables. Now, this is Queens right here. This is where I'm from. And this is Linden Boulevard, Cambria Heights, St. Albans. I'm from the town over Queens Village. Always a big influence. You know, LL Cool J. This guy's from Queens too, Farmers. I remember one time I was, um, I used to stay with his grandmother a lot. I went by his grandmother's house and she opened up the door and we were about to run, you know, because we at LL's house. And his grandma said, come on inside. And we walked inside and got to see some of his awards. It was just dope. She didn't know what. She just let kids in. It was just community, you know? Let's go. My first real party, and I'm not talking about the little backstreet parties we just learned. My first real party was at Queens Community College. And um, Clue actually got me the party. And Clue couldn't DJ the party because he went to school there. So he got me the party. And uh, I was DJing with records. And I was so nervous. I, could, I, I just remember the sweat dripping down my armpits. I just remember stinking that party up pretty bad. Where Clue was like, man, you got to go practice. It, it was, it was, that was my first failure and my first probably real party. The way I know that I made it as a DJ, I remember the, during the mixtape days, I was walking up Jamaica Avenue and this kid was with his parents. And uh, he came up to me and asked for an autograph. And that was the first time anybody asked me for an autograph. So I didn't know what to do. I, I signed it with Sean. And he looked at it, he was like, who's this? And I was like, that's me. He was like, no, no, I want you to put Envy. And I didn't even know what to sign. I've never practiced my autograph. I had no idea. That's how I knew that I arrived. Mixtape game was, was fun, it was it was new music. It wasn't the, the social media aspect, the internet wasn't big, it wasn't even around, I don't believe. So it was like, you know, you do a mixtape, that mixtape lasted you three weeks, four weeks, you know, and then by the time the mixtape was out, you was ready for a new one. So it was just, the music was so good and the music was so entertaining and it was so great. I used to have to drive to the record labels every other day to find new music and to find new songs and go to the studio all the time to get this new music. And it was it was fun. It was the fact that you would try to find a new artist. The fact that you would look for lyrics. The fact that you would look for for new beats and new music. It was encouraging. It was it was a great feeling. Music back then for me was a feeling. Like when I listened to it, it wasn't just hardcore rap because I grew up on, of course, the Nas's, the Jay-Z's, the Biggie's, the Mob Deep's, the Noriega's. It was also the Wyclef's and the Fuji's. It was just a feeling of music. And you were excited about that every time you put out a tape. You, know, you were excited about that intro freestyle. You was excited about if I had an R&B exclusive. Those were the things that you wanted to hear. And the, and, the, and the artists wanted to be on your tapes just as much as you wanted them on the tapes. So it was a feeling of, wow, which was great. This was my album, man, and I was super duper proud of this album. This album had everybody on it from Jay-Z, to Fabulous, the Locks, 50. I mean, you name it, they were on this album. This was my pride and joy, you know? I think we came out and did like 70, 80,000 units. No real commercial, no video, but this was my pride and joy. This is what I put my, my heart into when I produced this record. So it was dope, man. This is this my album. We're gonna have some other no fun tonight. Y'all excited to see DMX? DMX showed me that there was money outside of just urban music. You know, he was the first person to put my music in a movie. The first time I got to see a check, and it just, the just checks keep coming because I remember he did a movie and he allowed me to produce some of the records on the movie. And I got a check, and I was like, I was happy for that check. But then I didn't know you get a check when it's released international. And every international region is 
comes out, you get another check. And then every time the movie goes to VHS or VCR or DVD or Blu-ray, you get a check. So that was DMX that showed me that, so the dog. <laughs> As far as entrepreneurship, I always looked at people like Kid Capri, who I seen, and, and not only was he rocking parties, he was on Def Comedy Jam, and then I looked at Flex. If you look at him as a businessman, from some of the stuff he did from the, the TV shows, to his own programming, to creating a brand from the tunnel, to the Funkmaster Flex Whips, and all that stuff that he's created, showed that you could just do other things than just DJ. You can take that DJing hat, and make it into a business hat. I've been able to do that with a lot of stuff that I've done. Now, if you know anything about me, you know I, I love money, I love to invest, and I love my family. I love nice things as well, so we invest our money. So if you look at some of the things I'd invested into, a car wash, a sneaker store, I own a bunch of property, and this is the latest investment, Juices for Life BK. I'm into healthy living, making sure that I can live longer for my family, for my kids, and making sure that the community can live longer. So this is the first investment in Brooklyn. So uh, it looks a little crazy, but we're gonna spice it up. So it's the first day I got my key, so let's go inside, check it out. This is where it's gonna be nice. This is where we're gonna be making the juice. Then in the summertime, we'll have barbecues and people can actually come outside. And we're all about healthy. Not only healthy living, but giving back to the community. So it's not only just making money, it's also giving back. Everything healthy is gonna be for us and for our community. And this is, this is my, my actual partner right here, Angela Yee. Now, Angela Yee was that, the one that actually found the place. She found the spot, she found the location. She's from Brooklyn, so she actually found everything. I'm excited about it. I know Envy Juice is every morning, and so do I, so I kind of felt like we needed in this neighborhood. And we're actually gonna go through the process of learning how to do every part of this, from learning how to juice, learning how to... It needs a lot of work. Yeah, yeah, it needs a lot of work. So we're gonna learn how to make juicing, it, learn how to process, Learn how to everything about vegetables, wheatgrass, work the register, every <laughs> register too? Yeah, you gotta learn everything. Juices for Life BK, DJ MB, Angela Yee Styles P. So now I'm, I'm a part owner of a beverage company called Top Pop, which I'm very excited about. All natural sugar, all natural flavors. It's not as expensive as a lot of your premium brands. It's just a matter of expansion. I'm using how I market myself to market the soda company. Not only that, it's just what we do to give way, to give back. I mean, we bought over 100,000 bottles of water and sent to Flint, Michigan with the help of everybody that, that follows me and listens to me, which was dope. How are you? Good to see you, hi. This is Marlene, everybody. Well, we're taking you guys on the tour, so, so tell people what we're taking. So Whitworth and Oak Beverages. Mm -hmm. We're in the oldest beer distributor of New York. And what's 7-Eleven? We have, how many 7-Elevens are we in currently? Right now, we're 42 7-Elevens in the New York metro market. I think we should go on a 42-day run. Right? Down. <laughs> I said, well, if we gonna do this, it's hard. Every day we pick a 7-Eleven, and we promote where 7-Eleven I'm gonna be at, and try to drive some of my fans to come to that 7-Eleven and pick up some soda. Let's do it. Come down. Let's call it like the 42 days of summer, and just for 42 days straight, every day we go to 7-Eleven, and we promote it on our websites. And we try to get our fans to go there, and buy out the, the top yeah. pop to really push. Cool. I think that'd be dope. I think that'd be hot. Getting my first radio job was difficult. They did a show called Take It To The Streets, and I was doing mixtapes at the time. They picked four DJs for, for, for Take It To The Streets, and I wasn't one of them. And I didn't understand why. I'm like, I'm pushing more mixtapes than a lot of the guys that was on it. But they didn't hire me. So I was like, ah, right, you know, I just said, you know what, I'm gonna keep running and keep doing what I have to do. And uh, one of the DJs that was picked for it passed away. Rest in peace to DJ Threat. And when DJ Threat passed away, it opened the doors for another DJ to come, and they gave me that opportunity. And when they gave me the opportunity, if you know me, you know I'm not gonna let any opportunity just sit there, and just wait, just fall. So I was like, I'm gonna take that opportunity, and I took that opportunity, and I ran. And I just been working hard, busting my ass, trying to outwork anybody living. Any DJ out there, I try to work outwork. Whether it's outwork them in the clubs, I work them on the radio, I work their mixes, I work them as a family man, I work them as a businessman, I work any party that I could possibly do. Because that's my motivation and I've been doing it ever since. At DJ Envy right now, let's go!
Now, I'm from Queens, so you know growing up, cars was my big thing. So now it's time to pick up my son from the bus stop. He don't like this car. Now you see Rain, he don't like this car. Rolls Royce, he could care less. Dodge, all the speed challenger, doesn't care. Mercedes Benz, the new coupe, he could care less. But what he really loves is this right here. This right here is my son's favorite. And we're gonna go pick him up from the bus stop. Hopefully we don't get pulled over by police. Still a black man. Well, balancing career and family is, is very difficult. You're looking at a guy that has four kids and another one on the way. You know, I was always into having a child. Not only raising my child, being a good father, but being a friend. And that's what I think the best thing with my kids now is not only am, am I their dad, but I'm also their friend. Me and my kid, I, I can go back and forth with music, and I can take my son to a concert. We are into the same thing, which is the main thing, but balancing it is a difficult thing because I'm into my job. What I do is I keep my family with me. You know, when I go to All Star, or I go to Super Bowl, or I go to CIAA, if it's a, an event where I can take my kids, I bring the whole family. If it's an event where I take my wife, I take my wife. Not only that, is you know, when my son has tournaments, I'll fly out to where his, whatever city his tournaments are and broadcast my show from that city. You know, because the show's damn, my dad is, he's a hard worker. Yeah, my dad likes to make money, but my dad's always by my side, and I involve my family and my kids so they know what I'm doing, so they can see how dad makes money, so they know already before they get to the age of 21 how to make money and how to keep their money. Those are some of the things that I do, and I do miss a lot of sleep. I don't sleep as much as I should, but if it's between sleeping and going to my son's game, I'll take my son's game every time. If it's between sleeping and reading my daughter a book before she goes to sleep, I'm gonna read my daughter that book. If it's between sleeping and picking up my daughter, my son, or whoever from school, I'm gonna pick them up from school because there's no better feeling, there's no bigger check, there's not enough money in the world that when my daughter comes running out of that classroom to say that she loves her dad. There's nothing bigger than that. Morning, everybody. It's DJ MV Angela Yee, Charlemagne the Guy. We are the Breakfast Club. We have a very special guest today. Angela Bassett? Yeah. Marlon Wayans. <laughs> Mr. Chris Rock. Thank you. Mr. Kevin Hart. Kevin yeah. Hart. Yeah. Kanye West. Fetty Wap. Fetty Wap. Crazy. Yeah. What's up? Dr. Oz. Well, thanks for having me back. F. Gary Gray and Ice Cube. Hey. hey, hey. What up? What up? Men love to masturbate their Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds personal, Charlemagne. God. All those things that happened in the past, they all 100% true. Pete Davidson is here. Are you dancing around? No, did you not listen? Oh. Jesus Christ, you got a terrible interviewer and an even worse person. When I first got the call for Breakfast Club, I, I really didn't want to do it. You know, I was on Power already, and I was doing Afternoons, and Afternoons was great. The program director at the time, and I was like, no. And he was like, uh, why not? And I was like, I did mornings for four or five years with Miss Jones. I didn't really like waking up. It's hard because I do parties, I do shows, and it gives up a lot of your life. He made me an offer I couldn't refuse. It worked out. It worked out well. And we've been doing it for the last five years, going on six. We'll see you guys later. <laughs> the 2015 Global Spin Award for DJ of the Year goes to DJ Bicky Bicky Indy. 220 on the dash, but she drive me crazy. You know what makes this night special? Not the awards. This is a family reunion. And my daughter just turned 14, and this is her first date with her dad with my DJ family. That's what makes this so special with me, the fact that her dad is her first date and I'm gonna be her only date till she 40. But the fact that I'm here with family and she's able to see all this, I appreciate everybody for riding. And all the DJs out there, respect the DJ. Respect us, respect us, respect us. I love y'all, peace. When I won the Global Spin Award, it was amazing. This is actually my second DJ of the Year Award, which was dope. All that hard work and all that, that busting my ass every morning and doing these clubs, this, this means everything. I mean, it was just an honor to be, you know, recognized amongst your peers. And not only that, the fact that my daughter was there, she got to see that, she got to experience it. She got to go on stage with me. She got to see how much loved her dad is. Just imagine as a kid to see your dad being loved like that. She was just excited, you know, and she was on her phone and texting her friends, putting it on her Instagram and Snapchat. So she really got to see daddy out, and that was dope. My son wants to go next year, but you know, we'll see. Love, y'all. The highlights of DJing, not only in the States, but being able to DJ in Africa. 
you know, being able to go to Amsterdam, being able to DJ in, in all these different places that I would have never been able to go to. I mean, I spent a week in Africa. I spent two weeks in Japan. These are things that I was able to do for music. These are things I was able to do from spinning some records. You know, just a kid from Queens in Africa. You know, kids from Queens in Japan. You know, and to see some of these different people and the fact that they respect me and enjoy my music and like the things that I like is just, it's just dope. I think next for me is still having fun. I mean, the Breakfast Club is still doing well. We're still getting more and more markets, which is a blessing. That's opening the door for me DJing in so many different places. I mean, I've been on the road every weekend for, I mean, since I don't even know how long. But the, the best thing for me is, is seeing my kids grow or opening up another store. Those are the best things to me because it takes me outside of music. Music is always there. But taking that out and showing my people, whether it's the urban community or my DJ community, how to make money and how to invest in themselves and how to make it, that's more than anything because as a kid, nobody showed me. I want to be that one that shows little John from, from the hood, yo, I could take this $100 and flip it, make 1000 flip it, make 5000 flip it, make 10000 and make something where I don't have to do anything illegal. I want to show the community that I came from the same place, that I didn't have to sell no drugs, I didn't have to sell crack, I got my college degree, I did it the right way, I planned it out, and I made it work so they can make it work. Respect the DJ, respect the culture, and respect yourself out. Don't bother me, I'm working. 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 Don't work it. Can't you see I'm on the phone? See, don't, don't be coming over here with that shit when I'm working. Call me Mr. Combs and I'm nine digits strong. And it's hating on me, but it's nine. Working. When I was 19, I walked in the house and I told my mama she could stop. Working. When you niggas just the beatbox on the block, big and D rock, they was getting that. Then I linked up with some niggas from my hood who was known for putting that. And if your record ain't had nah, then your song and your song wasn't. Ran into this young Joan, tell her come home, she asked for a check. I said, bitch, niggas, you. Now every time she call, I don't even pick up, I just hit her with the text line. Don't bother me, I'm working.